My name is Frank Gaffney. I'm the executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy. I'm very pleased to be the moderator of the second in a series of webinars that the center is sponsoring with some of the, well, smartest and most informed experts on the Middle East and specifically on the vital importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship to our posture in that region, in to progress. our security Our... interests, and to, um, well, the ability of this country to meet myriad challenges that we are currently facing in that uh, region and, well, beyond as well. Um, we're very pleased to have with us um, uh, some of those uh, folks with whom we regularly consult and with whom we have, uh, I think, mostly very, um, well, valued relationships. Let me say not mostly. Every single one of these are people with whom we have very valued professional relationships and have for some time. And I'm particularly pleased to have with us uh, Dr. David Wormser, who is the uh, director of the Center for Security Policies, Middle East Policy and Programs. And um, David is going to uh, say just a few words, um, awaiting the arrival of um, our first speaker, uh, and flesh out a little bit the, the program of the Center in uh, the Middle East. And I just wanted to say, it couldn't be more topical at the moment in light of uh, developments we'll be discussing in the course of the next hour, both in Israel, in this country, and of course, in the region more broadly. And um, David Wormser, I want to thank you for your leadership in this space and uh, welcome you to say a few words uh, awaiting the arrival of Dr. Gold. Thank you, Frank. Um, Yes, what we realized over the last few months, really over the last year or two, uh, although it dates back much further, is that the U.S.-Israel relationship, there's there's some concerning trends underneath uh, that, that need to be addressed. Uh, part of it is the uh, progressive assault on the United States uh, from within. And the Israel issue has become one of the signal issues for the progressives to try to take down their vision of, uh, of what our foreign policy is and try to re uh, recreate an vi uh, alternate vision that is uh, much more progressive. And in that vision, Israel does, doesn't really have much of a role, or if it does, it's a very negative role. It's, uh, it, 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 it really questions the foundations of a, and not only a special relationship, but even an amicable relationship. So on one side, we see that the Israeli-American relationship is under stress. There's also a traditional, uh, uh, more uh, conservative viewpoint that uh, that we see uh, manifest in, in, in such senators as Rand Paul. They're very suspicious of the depth of the relationship. So we do see some real stresses being placed on the Israeli-American relationship, if even at the time the polls and so forth don't suggest the fundamental collapse of Israel's position. This is especially concerning, by the way, with youth, which means the future. Mm -hmm. On the other side, with the United States- let, let me just interrupt you. I realized that uh, Dr. Gold was waiting in the wings and I didn't oh. realize he was he was there. So I promised him that we would let, allow let him, him to make some opening comments and then uh, the get, get so. on to his other business. We'll be coming back to you uh, at sure. the conclusion of the program, but thank you for buying us a little time uh, sure. awaiting Dr. Gold's arrival. Um, Ambassador Dory Gold um, has had a remarkable uh, career of service in his adopted uh, land of Israel. He was born here in the United States, but has served for almost three decades in senior positions, um, both diplomatic and advisory, um, in the US, the Israeli government, um, including, among other posts, uh, that of the permanent representative of Israel in the United Nations. 
um, an experience that he chronicled in one of um, his many books, I believe 22, if I'm not mistaken, that he's authored, co-authored or edited, um, The Tower of Babel, <laughs> which was particularly apt, of course. Um, he is also the author of Hatred's Kingdom and the Fight for Jerusalem, an essayist and public intellectual of the First Order. Uh, a good friend of the Center for Security Policies, as is the organization which he's the president, uh, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Mr. Ambassador, it's great to have you with us. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and give us uh, sort of a keynote to our webinar today. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Are you there? Of Zoom. There you go. Now, can you hear me? We can now hear you. You're good to go, sir. Okay. So um, I just have to um, make a correction. I am no longer the president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. I resigned from that position so that I could take up other things as well. And that is the story. I don't want to be in a position where I misrepresented, and I'm sure there was no intent behind that. My um, apologies, sir. It's okay. Now, to get to our subject at hand, you know, I was thinking back in 2015, I had spent a year having meetings with a, um, a Saudi general who came from their intelligence branch. His name was uh, Anwar Eshki. And... Um, he was very interested in having us testify in one of uh, Congress's uh, committees uh, about the dangers emanating from the um, deal that um, uh, the Obama administration had worked on, uh, <clears throat> the deal which we would call, I guess, the Iran nuclear uh, deal. And um, at one point I said, look, you know, you're a think tank, I'm a think tank. Why don't we both go to a Washington think tank? And most of the people who um, might watch this uh, on C-SPAN or, or something like that would get it, would obtain it and could watch it. And uh, anyway, make a long story short, we appeared at the Council on Foreign Relations and um, what was remarkable was having an Israeli and a Saudi together sounding somewhat similar, not somewhat, very similar in their views of the dangers in the Middle East. And we both watched the audience. Who basically, the audience had in it the um, usual suspects, so to speak, who go to Middle East um, conferences and it became very clear that far more united us and far more um, held us uh, in different positions from most of the uh, American Middle Eastern scholars. And that was kind of warning sign to me that Israelis and Americans have a lot of work to do to make sure that um, certainly in Washington, that our positions are better understood. And I think that's what I've been working on over the last number of years, not always successfully, but I think it was a kind of warning signal, for lack of a better term, uh, about the uh, gaps between uh, Israeli positions and the positions you were seeing in some of the uh, places that housed the, um, uh, the possessors of the conventional wisdom at the time. And that problem continues actually to this very day. And to even point out how 
the problem has become more acute, it becomes very important to look at um, to look at how America is seeing many of the Middle Eastern issues and other issues differently from Israel and the Arabs. And to some extent, we've grown closer, not necessarily building on strong positions of trust all the time, but we've grown closer with many of our Arab neighbors than we have with certain of the usual suspects that uh, appear on those um, television shows on Sunday in the United States. Now, why that has happened, you know, is beyond the scope or time that we have for this conference. But if we want the U.S. to um, skillfully maneuver and defend its interests in the Middle East, the way it, has, it is changing, it's going to require a much more uh, enhanced dialogue between uh, Israeli thinkers and American thinkers, uh, Israeli politicians and American politicians. And I think uh, organizations like the Center for Security Policy could contribute a great deal if they furthered that dialogue. But don't assume with the region changing the way it is changing, that we will see uh, the Middle East the same way as we did in the past. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Um, this is uh, a, certainly an important backdrop to our conversation today, and as well as a, uh, a call to action. And we're happy to be responding to it with your help, and we appreciate very much your being with us. I, I know you have to move along, and uh, we want to say thank you for joining us today and uh, for all you're doing um, in your various capacities, as well as what you've done in the past uh, to foster the U.S. Israeli relationship, a special relationship, we believe it is and needs to be, um, but one that is in some difficulty at the moment, as we'll be discussing further after you depart. Thank you, sir. It's good to have you Our with pleasure. us. Take care. Uh, we're going to turn, turn next, I think, um, to our uh, senior fellow based in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Carolyn Glick is her name. She has contributed to uh, the first of these webinars, as well as to much of the work of the center with which she's been associated for many many years. Um, Carolyn is, um, as I say, a senior fellow with us, but also, among other things, um, a very prolific essayist, columnist, and author, uh, notably of two really important books, Shackled Warrior and the Israeli Solution. Uh, she contributes to Channel 14 in Israel. Uh, she is a podcaster with her own television program, The Carolyn Glick Show, <clears throat> and not least, <clears throat> excuse me, I understand it is her birthday today, and we're very happy to have her with us for our birthday party for Carolyn Glick. Carolyn, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Happy birthday to you, and um, we're delighted to have you with us to talk about your perspective on some of the challenges the U.S.-Israel relationship is experiencing now, uh, both at the Washington end, but also uh, as manifested in Israel itself. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, kind birthday greetings. I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I, I think maybe the best start way to play, the way to start this is with a statement that Robert Wood, who's the alternate UN representative for the US uh, for special political affairs at the uh, UN uh, this week, um, he, 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 it was, a uh, one of the monthly meetings, uh, to condemn Israel on the Palestinian issue that take place at the UN. And Wood said, uh, the United States expects to see equal treatment of extremists, whether Israeli or Palestinian, in arrests, convictions, and punishments, as well as equal allocation of resources 
to prevent uh, and investigate violent attacks. And so what we see here uh, in this statement is sort of a, a, a pure version of moral equivalence where uh, the, uh, the uh, US representative at the UN, uh, Mr. Wood, was saying that there's absolutely no disparity or no distinction, no difference between uh, Israeli civilians, Israeli security services, and Palestinian terrorists. This isn't the first time that we've seen this either from the Biden administration or from anywhere else, but or from other you know uh, previous administrations aside from the Trump administration. Really, I would say every American uh, administration in recent memory has, uh, to one degree or another, engaged in moral equivalence between Palestinian terrorists and Israeli civilians and military forces, but we really haven't seen it to at, at such a high level and in such a pure form uh, uh, as we're now seeing with the Biden administration. It really does seem to be their um, overwhelming concept of what Israel is, that Israel if any, if at best, is no better than a terror uh, than, than terrorists, and at worst, is is worse than they are, as we saw with the FBI, uh, which is now investigating uh, IDF soldiers for killing a uh, a, a journalist, I suppose, uh, named Shirin Abu Akleh, who was embedded with Islamic Jihad terrorists during a firefight that they instigated against uh, Israeli forces in Jenin earlier this year. Um, that in, that investigation is also unprecedented. That the United States would treat uh, Israeli soldiers engaged in counterterrorism warfare as reasonable suspects for a criminal uh, probe by the FBI is something that is just uh, beyond undiplomatic, and it's 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 extremely insulting, and it also speaks very ill about the trajectory of the of the U.S. Uh, move. And I just want to say. Um, First, one thing about why it is that the United States is on this trajectory, and then and then go to what you know what and how Israel and the incoming government uh, will will likely respond to it. How I think it ought to respond to it, and and really what what lays ahead for U.S. Israel relations. And this is all very brief, so I'm I'll, I'll summarize very quickly. Um, and as I wrote in my book, one of them that you mentioned, the uh, Israeli solution. Um, We've seen, I would, I would argue, since at least the Nixon administration, and to ever increasing levels with each uh, each uh, successive administration, a blindness on the part of the the U.S. government about the nature of the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, and of course there are multiple conflicts. But we saw beginning with the Rogers Plan under Nixon in 1970, and then subsequent US uh, peace plans that have been put forward by the Reagan administration, obviously by the Carter administration, uh, Ford, and on into um, you know, Bush senior, Clinton, the Oslo peace process, so-called, and uh, Obama, Bush uh, junior, and and then and then there was a break with Trump, and it's gone back to it with, with uh, Biden, is that the United States is under the impression or has been the policy of the U.S. government uh, to believe that the root of the Arab-Israel conflict is the absence of a Palestinian state, and that state does not exist largely for one reason, which is that Israel controls the land that that state is supposed to be established on. And uh, that, uh, as Clinton once said, all of the problems of the Middle East, all of the problems of uh, Arab terrorism will be solved if there is a Palestinian state established, and obviously I'm paraphrasing, but that is the sort of concept that's been guiding U.S. policy largely for the Middle East uh, for decades, and, um, and it's totally wrong, and it's been shown to be wrong repeatedly uh, for the past 50-odd years since uh, the Rogers Plan uh, came out. Uh, shortly after I was born uh, in 1970. And um, so we're we're talking about uh, a middle-aged misconception already uh, upon which U.S. Middle East policy is based. And that misconception has also blinded the United States uh, repeatedly to the pathologies of the region. It was one of the reasons that uh, the, the Obama administration failed to understand what the, the nature of the Arab Spring, that it was a, a rise of jihadist forces under the Muslim Brotherhood, or for that matter, that the Muslim Brotherhood is not a friendly organization to the United States. Um, and that's just one example. But when you take 
uh, when you massively uh, ex exaggerate the importance of, of the Palestinian conflict with Israel, uh, and then say that this is the be all and end all of the pathologies of the Middle East. And all you have to do is solve this. And the way to solve it is by putting the squeeze on Israel to give up territory to the PLO or to whatever other Palestinian terrorist organization is calling the shots uh, uh, on any particular day, um, then you're gonna get everything else wrong as well. Um, and when you add to that um, basic misconception, um, the radicalization of the uh, Democratic Party under the uh, progressive woke ideology, which is, I argue, uh, anti-American, but it's also uh, antithetical to the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, values of, of the United States and, and foundations of the United States, then you have other reasons why the Democrat Party in particular uh, is going is moving away from Israel because you know for for all time really the one of the bases of the U.S. Israel relations aside from shared strategic uh, in, interests is uh, shared values and when you have uh, the now the ruling party in the United States uh, submerged in in progressive values, well, those aren't the same values as have animated the United States throughout its history, and that directed the United States towards a, a caring um, and mutually supportive relationship with the Jewish state. So, uh, if you have a values change, you're also going to have a negative trajectory. For, uh, for ties. Um, the incoming Israeli government uh, is led by probably the most extraordinary statesman that has ever led Israel, which is Benjamin Netanyahu, of course. And uh, he knows the United States very well. Uh, he's uh, clearly uh, cognizant and fully cognizant of the nature of, uh, of progressivism in the United States and its view and outlook towards Israel. So I think that um, you know he has said repeatedly that and and rightly that he's had friendly relations with uh, David Wormser. I mean David Wormser. I'm looking at David, and I meant to say uh, Joe Biden, but I'm sure that he really likes David as well. But that he's had uh, uh, good relations with uh, with uh, Joe Biden for for many many years, and um, that he will do his best to uh, maintain. Of friendly ties with the president and uh, seek out uh, as he as all Israeli leaders do, but in this case, importantly, uh, areas of uh, common interest and common concern on both sides. I, it becomes more difficult, obviously, uh, because you have an administration that is not uh, well intentioned towards Israel, and I think that. Other than that, just to complete my remarks, to go back to the Trump administration and what really distinguished it from its predecessors as well as its successor, which is that um, really alone among uh, U.S. leaders, President Trump, I think largely because he wanted to leave the region, he wanted to walk away from what he referred to as the endless wars of the Middle East, he decided that the best way to do it was not to <laughs> do what the Palestinian-centric Middle East policy dictates, which is to be bad to your friends, your most loyal friend in this case, Israel, and good to your enemies, in this case, Palestinian terrorists uh, who are backed by uh, America's worst enemies, but rather to be good to your friends and bad to your enemies, because then your friends will be able to fight the battles that are common to both the United States and to its allies, and its enemies won't want to raise their head out of fear because the United States is standing with its allies and enabling them, facilitating through weapons sales and political support, uh, their ability to uh, stand up for themselves. So I think that um, that is the proper policy, <laughs> obviously from the perspective of an American ally, I think it's probably also a good policy for the United States. It certainly brought fantastic results for the United States during. Uh, the four-year tenure of President Trump. But I think that building on that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that Israel is going to, or perhaps this is wishful thinking, but, but my hope would be that the incoming government would also be seeking to expand our bilateral ties with our Abraham Accords uh, 
partners, both those that are openly within the Abraham Accords and those that are supporting it from outside, like Oman and, and Saudi Arabia, um, and also work to uh, somewhat diminish our strategic uh, our strategic uh, dependence on the United States, among other things, by moving production lines for the uh, Iron Dome missiles uh, to Israel and uh, restoring Israeli control over the uh, of the Iron Beam uh, military laser uh, project that uh, that the outgoing government is effectively transferred to to uh, Lockheed. Um, so we'll we'll have to see how that goes, but I think that those. Those, those are, are the, the things that we can expect from the incoming government. I think that the trajectory of the Biden administration is unfortunately mm -hmm. not great, um, but uh, okay, that, that's where things are. And Israel, obviously, because it has the same strategic interests at base that the United States has, whether the, the any specific administration wants to recognize that or not is another story, um, but that Israel uh, and a strong Israel will continue to advance and, uh, and and secure uh, Israel's, uh, I mean, America's core interests as well in, in the region. Carolyn Glick, thank you. That was splendid and, uh, and vitally important, I think, in terms of, again, um, establishing the context in which this conversation is taking place, uh, namely developments um, in Israel at the moment. Uh, the new government uh, will probably come back to you for uh, some more insights into uh, the makeup, the shape, uh, the uh, the trajectory, to use your phrase, of that government, uh, which we expect will be announced uh, momentarily uh, as the deadline looms. Um, we're going to turn next uh, for uh, a further appreciation of the challenges we're facing here in the United States. Uh, with respect to the Middle East in general and uh, to Israel in particular. Uh, with the man who joined us on our last program, we're very pleased to say, who's been a very dear friend uh, for many, many years, um, who has just returned from one of the most problematic nations in the Middle East, Turkey, where he spent, uh, I think, a week recently um, doing sort of an on-site inspection of what the Turks are up to and the challenges that uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's regime and its policies represent for all of the things that we're talking about today. Uh, his name is Mort Klein. Uh, he is the very distinguished uh, longtime president of the Zionist Organization of America. Um, he has been an absolutely irrepressible um, force, I believe, for good in uh, both his public um, advocacy on behalf of the U.S.-Israel relationship, his <laughs> efforts to um, <coughs> bring clarity where it is often lacking in terms of some of the fundamentals uh, that affect that relationship. And uh, he's been, I think, in short, a remarkable freedom fighter. Uh, most especially during his time at COA, uh, but even before. Uh, he was trained as an economist and a statistician, among other things. He is the recipient of the Center for Security Policy's highest recognition, the Keeper of the Flame Award. And we're delighted to have him back to give us his perspective, uh, both informed by your recent trip, Mort, and um, what is happening around us at the moment here and in Israel, for that matter, uh, as we uh, think about and champion a stronger U.S.-Israel relationship. The floor is yours, sir. Well, uh, thank you so much, Frank, and uh, everyone else. I, <clears throat> I just got back from Turkey, as Frank mentioned. Uh, I'm still jet lagged. Um, <laughs> I'll just say a couple of quick things. Uh, I met with the uh, many of the uh, important leaders in Turkey, uh, from the top one down. Uh, I never experienced such hostility from foreign leaders as I did from the leaders in Turkey. They blamed Israel for everything. Uh, they praised Hamas as freedom fighters. 
when I talk to them about Hamas launching rockets indiscriminately into the civilian areas, <laughs> don't you consider these, this, these, this a terrorist act? They said, this is Israel's fault. It's because they kill so many Arabs and because they've launched missile attacks against in Gaza. When I said if Hamas had not launched attacks against Israel, Israel would never launch attacks. This is a retaliation to try and stop the Hamas rockets. They would not accept that. They just said, this is all Israel's fault. When I asked them, <laughs> I said, in order to move the relationship further along, it's very important for you to uh, remove the Hamas leaders who are working out of Istanbul, directing terrorist attacks in Judea and Samaria and elsewhere. They said they will never uh, remove them. That won't happen. And they said, why is that a priority for you? Why does that matter? Isn't all that matters that we have relations now? Uh, why, why are you emphasizing something that's not that important? And I said, of course, the relationship is very important. I'm thrilled that there's relations now, exchange of ambassadors. Uh, but this is also important, not, not quite as important. <laughs> so, I mean, the bottom line is uh, I felt uh, nothing but hostility from the Turkish leaders uh, toward Israel and even toward Jews, I would say. In my meetings, there was almost no smiles. Even the pictures I took, they didn't smile. Uh, uh, the deputy foreign minister, uh, Sadat Onal, did give me his card and told me that next month he's coming to New York. He's going to be the Turkish ambassador to the United Nations. He did ask me to keep in touch with him. Let's get together. Let's speak again. Uh, but as I was expressing my concerns, he and others would say things like, I thought this was going to be a friendly meeting. I thought this was supposed to be a friendly meeting. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't say anything hostile except what I just told you, I said, and they got very upset about it. They didn't like it. So I was personally shocked. I might add my a Turkish Muslim host who actually brought me there, uh, uh, tell me that Turks love Israel. They care deeply about Israel. My friends, they say they want to do business in Israel. They also said to me, they think once Erdogan is reelected in June, he will change. I don't know why necessarily that'll be, but he said after that, he'll remove the Hamas leaders in Istanbul and uh, he'll become friendlier toward Israel. This was the impression of these very, very successful businessmen who I became very friendly with. <laughs> um, I don't know what else I, I can say that's uh, of, of importance to this group. I will say uh, that I think this administration uh, is the worst administration for Israel ever. It's worse than the first Obama administration because I believe it is Obama running the show now. And he has the front man, Biden, who has this, a, an image of being somewhat friendly toward Israel, even though he does what he's told now. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I think we're in for very rough times for those of us who care deeply about the US-Israel relationship. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, for an administration only uh, yesterday, two days ago, the deputy uh, uh, ambassador to the United Nations would <laughs> complain about Israel not spending as much resources in fighting uh, Jewish terrorism as they do Palestinian Arab terrorism. An astonishing remark, I thought. And for them to be involved with an internal affair of terrorism for Israel, Israel has great experience with terrorism. They, they know what they have to do. Uh, this really showed the enormous hostility of this administration to Israel. <coughs> They're complaining about Smotrich and Ben Gavir, the religious Zionist party. Uh, you know, uh, democratically elected. The, the Democrats are always screaming about, you know, uh, you have to respect elections here. They're not respecting the Israeli election at all. And of course, when Ra'am and Meretz were in the government, uh, they never complained about them, uh, even though uh, they were extraordinarily extreme. Uh, uh, and it's also disappointing that I see Jewish leaders complaining about uh, Smotrich and Gavir, even Foxman. I mean, who cares about Foxman? He's a retired man 
for him to publicly be saying, the former head of ADL, that if, unless, uh, if certain policies are enacted, he will no longer support Israel. Not he'll criticize Israel, he'll condemn Israel, he'll be upset with Israel. No, he won't support Israel. Astonishing remark. Uh, he should have been condemned by everyone for that. We condemned him. I'm not sure many other people condemned him, and he should have been. This was an outrageous remark. Um, so again, Jewish leaders are condemning uh, this new government. Uh, never condemn Ra'am being in the government, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so, uh, and only two days after the White House anti-Semitism meeting, he uh, nominates uh, a Jew hater, uh, uh, I forget her name, frankly, as ambassador to, uh, to uh, Brazil, two days after the anti-Semitism meeting. And the anti-Semitism meeting really told us a lot. <laughs> you have the spouse of the ineffective vice president co-chairing the meeting, a man with no responsibility, no power, not able to do anything. This is who should co-chair a, a serious meeting on anti-Semitism. And the other co-chair was Susan Rice, one of the most hostile people ever when it came to the Jewish state of Israel. She endorsed it, uh, Resolution 2334, saying everything past the 6-7 line is uh, Arab territory. Uh, she condemned Israel building in Eastern Jerusalem, let alone Judea and Samaria. Uh, this is not a person who should be co-chairing uh, a discussion about Jew hatred. Uh, she has no credibility. She's not interested. So this really tells you how insincere, what a sham this entire process of uh, fighting anti-Semitism by the White House is uh, when you have these two as co-chairs. So, uh, so I'm very worried. This, I think this administration now and this uh, 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 last two years of Biden's term are going to become even more hostile to Israel, even more extraordinary pressure. I hope Netanyahu is up to the task of re resisting this. Uh, and, uh, and uh, what makes me even more worried, as I mentioned, is that Jewish leaders uh, are speaking out against this government already. Just astonishing. Uh, so uh, it's going to be important for those of us who are rational thinkers uh, to be uh, supporting this government, uh, making it clear uh, that uh, the policies they're enacting, uh, I think, are in, in positive policies for, for Israel. And uh, uh, I guess that's uh, that's my contribution. That's that's all I have to say. I'm I'm worried about the future. Well, I think uh, it's what brings us all together, as uh, we are as well. Thank you, Mort. This was really important. I think, especially informed, as I said, by your uh, recent firsthand exposure to uh, anti-Semitism of a high order in Turkey. And uh, I appreciate very much your uh, you know, firsthand account of it. Um, we're going to turn next to another very seasoned observer, analyst, and I think one of the most insightful commentators about the uh, nature of the Middle East, the developments that are taking place there, uh, how they bear on Americans' vital interests in particular. Uh, her name is Shoshana Bryan. Uh, she is the senior director of the Jewish Policy Center. Uh, she is a co-author of the second volume of essays in technology, security, and strategy. And uh, by my lights, really one of the most brilliant um, folks engaged in this particular portfolio. And it's always a pleasure to have a chance to visit with her. And uh, we'll do that now. Shoshana Bryan, welcome. Thank you, Frank. It's very nice to be here. I'm going to be the um, silver lining in the cloud. Not a ray of sunshine. It's not big enough to be a ray of sunshine, but I will be a silver lining because I'm going to talk very briefly about U.S.-Israel security relations, which is not too bad. Maybe it's, maybe it's really good. I'll start with a story that I only learned recently. For most Americans, the exit from Afghanistan in uh, August of 2021 was a huge mess. It was a huge disaster. Um, I'm not sure we all realized quite how bad it was. As the evacuation was taking place, a Taliban 
a car attached itself to a convoy headed for the airport and just outside the gate, it blew up, killing 11 Marines, a Navy corpsman, an Army Special Operations Officer and about 100 Afghans. Right after that, what Americans saw on their television was the exit of the 82nd Airborne Division Commander, Major General Chris Donahue, getting on the last flight out of Kabul. So what's the difference between the first one that blew up and the second one that didn't blow up? The answer, it appears, is Israel. Because although Israel hadn't yet made it into CENTCOM, the Israelis were tracking ISIS and the Israeli intelligence community understood what was going to happen in Kabul. And they understood it down to the granular details. And they gave information directly to um, their CENTCOM friends. And so the guys in CENTCOM had some warning. They were able to divert one convoy. They were not able to divert the other. What it tells you is that Israel is operating in many, many ways, not only for the security of the state of Israel, but also to help its American friends. Now, come up to November 15th of this year. It's a nice jump in time and space. The um, commander of CENTCOM is a general named Eric Carrilla. In November, he was in Israel for his fourth visit in seven months. Uh, he took over CENTCOM in the spring of uh, 2022. He was making his fourth visit to Israel in November. That's a lot of visits for people who hadn't really been talking to Israel that long, we don't think, and maybe they were. He didn't just go to do Iran. Everybody thinks that Israel went to CENTCOM in order to enable the United States to deal better with Iran. And that is a huge priority both for Israel and for the United States. But General Carrillo went to the Northern Command. General Carrillo went to see Hezbollah in Lebanon. He went to see um, the Iranian supply lines in Syria. He went to see, you know, the smuggling routes. He went to see what Israel's doing with its bombs in uh, Syria. And his comment afterwards was, first of all, very complimentary of the IDF, but he said our strategic partnerships within the region to include our longstanding ironclad relationship with the IDF are critical to regional security and stability. All these trips to the region inform my understanding of the threats and challenges faced by each country. So Carrilla is out there, he's on it, he's happy about it. Um, and at the same time he was doing that, IDF uh, Chief of Staff Aviv Kochavi was meeting with American uh, security professionals, talking about um, operating together, this is Kochavi, operating together on all fronts to gather intelligence, to neutralize threats, to prepare for various scenarios in one or multiple arenas. There are Israelis who will tell you the United States has finally agreed that if Israel needs to attack Iran in order to keep Iran from um, finishing its nuclear weapons capabilities, producing an actual bomb, doing something that's almost unrecoverable, the United States will help. And that squares with the last two exercises the US and Israel had. In August, there was a joint missile defense test. And in November, there was a three-day exercise over the Mediterranean Sea and Israel. And that was a um, fighter escort and aerial refueling exercise. Precisely the th sort of thing you would want to have if the United States and Israel were to cooperate on a mission in Iran. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the reason it was held over the Mediterranean was so that the Iranians wouldn't jump to the conclusion that this was an actual attack on Iran and do something about it. So they wisely moved it over to the Mediterranean. The Pentagon smokes spokesman said, this is a long planned exercise. It's not that unusual. I would say it is very unusual. You have extraordinarily close operational and strategic planning relations between Israel and the United States in the area of the greatest threat to both of them at a time when the government of the United States is still talking vaguely, but still talking about coming to some diplomatic um, understanding with Iran. So I think this is really amazing. It is part of the US government. Military people will only do what they are permitted to do. But the planning part belongs in essence to the military. It is the military's job to understand the threats 
and to inform the civilian leadership of those threats. And here's the silver lining in our cloud. These guys are working with Israel to define the threat. It's not the answer to the problem. It doesn't make us safe, as in safe. But it's a mechanism for ensuring that the United States military and the Israeli military see eye to eye about what is indeed the greatest threat to both of us, and that is the potential for a nuclear Iran. I'm going to stop there. Krishna, thank you. Um, good news is always welcome, and um, especially, as you say, at a moment when the gloominess of the clouds is palpable, uh, to find any silver lining at all is uh, is very appreciated. And and in particular, I I was unaware personally of the uh, the nature of some of these exercises and uh, and the agreement that you say is in place. Uh, that's well heartening, uh, to say the least. A man who has been intimately involved in policy making at uh, the highest levels of the United States government on Middle East matters um, is going to pick up the baton at this point. His name is Michael, Dr. Michael Duran. He has a, a wealth of relevant experience, notably as the director of, um, a senior director rather, at uh, the National Security Council. Uh, responsible for this portfolio. Um, he is these days the senior fellow and director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at the Hudson Institute um, and the author of, again, countless essays and articles and columns, uh, but also a number of books, including most recently, Ike's Gamble, America's Rise to Dominance in the Middle East. Um, Dr. Duran, it is great to have you with us, and uh, I'm particularly anxious to get your thoughts on what we've just heard and uh, the balance between uh, the gloom and uh, the silver linings. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, and I, I'm going to take uh, Shoshana's uh, uh, silver lining and go a step further and say that I'm really uh, optimistic, oddly. Uh, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do, I've set for myself the amazing task of agreeing with every word that Carolyn Glick said, and yet coming out very, very optimistic about it all. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, uh, the issue I think here is that, first of all, I do agree with everything that Carolyn said. Uh, uh, we do have this uh, progressive worldview, which has uh, taken over. Um, uh, it's certainly it's dominant in the uh, dominant in, among the Democrats, and it's also influenced the national security elite uh, uh, more uh, more broadly. Um, that's the that's the bad news, uh, and there's more bad news about it too. Uh, it does downgrade I Israel, and it downgrades uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, the the progressive worldview uh, translated into a foreign policy strategy uh, says that the goal of the United States should be to seek an accommodation uh, with Iran in the Middle East, uh, because the Middle East is no longer as important uh, in, in world affairs as it used to be. The, fo the focus is now on the competition with China. And the competition with China, it assumes, is not particularly uh, grave in the Middle East. We should be focusing our attention to East Asia. Um, and um, the second uh, priority of American foreign policy is Russia. Also, the competition in the Middle East is, according to the progressive worldview, uh, is, is, not that, uh, is not that significant. Uh, the United States needs to pull back from the Middle East. In order to pull back from the Middle East, it should work with uh, 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 work to find an accommodation with Iran. It will always there will always be tensions and difficulties, but we can uh, are uh, we have ultimately shared interests with Iran um, uh, that uh, if we adopt a um, a more benign attitude toward the regime, uh, a more conciliatory attitude, and we lead with diplomacy, we can unlock the shared. Uh, uh, we we can come to uh, understandings based on these shared interests between Iran and the United States. Um, and um, the the problem, the big problem, is that uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia are acting as a kind of catapult 
throwing us into conflict with Iran. So we need to tamp down the hostility of Saudi Arabia and Israel toward Iran um, and position the United States as a kind of mediator uh, between, uh, uh, between Iran, uh, between on the one hand, Iran and its proxies, uh, Hezbollah, the Houthis, etc., um, and uh, on the other hand, America's uh, allies, and 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 that's what we're seeing. And for that reason, although you know, if we look at what's happened over the last year, uh, we know that Iran is actively pursuing plots to kill former American officials. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Iran is supplying drones. Uh, and probably missiles too. We'll see uh, to Russia to to uh, uh, so that uh, that are having a very significant effect effect on the battlefield in um, uh, in in Ukraine. Uh, Iran is killing protesters at home. Uh, Iran is uh, is violating its uh, its NPT and JCPOA obligations, enriching uranium to sixty percent. It could now within a matter of weeks, uh, it will have enough fissile material to build uh, four. Uh, nuclear devices, um, uh, and we know it's it's taking positions in the negotiations over the JCPOA that are uh, frankly absurd. Clearly, just trying to string out the negotiations, not looking for a deal. Despite all of that, the administration won't say that the JCPOA uh, is no longer valid. It won't go for snapback in the UN, uh, um, and it won't take any aggressive countermeasures against uh, Iran. Uh, and, and so that is the bad news, uh, and, and it is definitely bad news. Uh, the good news, though, is that um, th this is not sustainable, uh, uh, in, uh, in my view, and it's becoming less and less uh, sustainable um, uh, as we go along. Uh, Americans are seeing the effect of the Iranian drones in, um, in Ukraine. The, the, the depth of the strategic alliance between Russia and Iran, and I think increasingly the alignment between Russia, Iran, and China is becoming very obvious. Uh, so it, the the argument that uh, the, the argument that our Middle East allies are throwing us into conflict with their, uh, with Iran uh, becomes harder and harder to sell uh, to anyone who isn't already a catechized uh, uh, progressive. Uh, clearly, Iran is a threat, uh, part of a global threat uh, to the American uh, to the American position. <laughs> um, and uh, I think as uh, as time goes on. We're going to see, as I think all everyone else on this panel said, Israeli interests and American interests, when properly understood, American interests when properly understood, and Israeli interests are in almost a perfect alignment. Um, and there, the the desire on the part of American leaders, um, uh, and that's Republicans and Democrats, not to get involved in another major military action in the Middle East. Um, Combined with the fact that the Iranian threat is not going to go away, we're not going to find the, the progressives dreamed of accommodation in the United States um, uh, and Iran. All of those things together mean that the United States is increasingly going to rely on Israel. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I think it has no choice. <laughs> Israel, is, Israel is going to become uh, the best ally of the United States in the world. Uh, it's going to be, the, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be having discussions ten years from now. If, who's the best ally? Is it is it Britain or or uh, or, uh, or or Israel? Because the Middle East is going to remain vital to the United States. There is a competition with China over the Middle East. We can see that increasingly. Xi Jinping was just in Saudi Arabia. Uh, 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 he is uh, increasingly driving wedges between the United States and its allies in a lot of clever, uh, uh, clever ways. He was trying to build a military base in the UAE, uh, which the United States uh, uh, shut down. So the 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 progressive assumption that there's no competition with China in the Middle East is false. The progressive assumption that there's an accommodation with Iran is false. All that remains is the, the desire not to get deeply mired in a conflict in the Middle East. And the only way to do that, to meet the, to, 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 uh, to meet the threats uh, against the United States without using American military force is to rely on allies. And when we go searching for an ally who can do that for us, 
we're going to find Israel. Even the Democrats are going to find Israel. And they're also going to find it now that we have the Netanyahu government, they're going to find it harder and harder to come up with reasons why Israel cannot protect itself against Iran and against the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, so I think uh, it's my uh, impression, my strong impression that under the Biden administration, uh, the Israeli uh, the Israeli government uh, 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 the Israeli government restrained itself with regard to carrying out acts of sabotage against the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, I'm assuming that the acts of sabotage that we saw um, under the uh, under the Trump administration and at the very beginning of the Biden, Biden administration were carried out by the Israelis. Of course, we don't know that for a fact, uh, but that's I think a, a, a pretty sane working assumption. And we, we've seen that the tempo of those actions has uh, uh, has diminished considerably under Biden. I'm assuming, again, have no evidence of this, but I'm assuming that uh, the Americans put the brakes on the Israeli, on the Israeli actions. Uh, I, I, I think we're going to see under the we're going to see under the, the, the new Netanyahu government a return to those actions. And there's it's going to be very, very hard for the uh, for the Biden administration to tell uh, the Israelis <laughs> not to take these actions. And when the Israelis take them and the Americans are angry about it, it's going to be very hard for the um, uh, for the Biden administration to explain to its own people, um, including Democrats, why our ally cannot uh, 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 cannot carry out these uh, these acts. Um, let me just say one one last word. I agreed with every word that uh, Shoshana said and, and her silver lining. Uh, but I want to be a. I want to put the. Uh, I, I want to be a little pessimistic on that note, slightly, 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 um, and and that's just that. Uh, well, let's put it this way, uh, Colin Call, uh, the uh, uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, the number three in the Pentagon, um, recently told uh, 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 some visitors to the Pentagon that the United States is no longer a security provider in the Middle East. It's a security integrator. Um, and, and this is, a, uh, um, this is a, a, a very meaningful distinction that he's made. I think it's a silly and erroneous one to make. I mean, it's an erroneous policy, but I think it really reflects how they see things. Uh, Israel is now in CENTCOM, and the, the, the CENTCOM is working toward uh, it, it, its, um, um, you know, the, um, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's, its primary, its, uh, its uh, goal, holy grail, is integrated missile defense among all of America's allies in, in, in the region. That's um, uh, we can see that now as an as a um, uh, as a real possibility, and it's a great thing. The pro the problem is that Iranian missiles and drones can overwhelm any defensive system, even top of the line American and, and Israeli defenses. Uh, the uh, Iranians have ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones. Um, they have different types of each. And they all, each one of those has a different flight pattern. And what they do is they combine the missiles, cruise missiles, and drones together in the same strike packages. And this, it overwhelms the sensors. The sensors can't, um, can't sort out all those different flight patterns coming at them, coming at them once. So those will break through. And so the defense economics don't work because the drones are cheap. It costs about $25,000 for a, an, an Iranian track uh, a, a, a attack drone. Um, uh, the defense economics don't work, uh, and uh, and the cost of the of one of the um, um, you know uh, uh, the, the defense economics don't work, and the and the defensive net is not perfect. So some of those missiles and drones are going to break through, and we've seen it time and time again. <laughs> Uh, uh, most notably, for example, in last January, when the Houthis uh, attacked the, uh, the the UAE, including attacked an American um, um, uh, American forces based in the um, uh, in in the UAE. So uh, the only way to deter the Iranians is with offensive countermeasures. That is the only way. And the United States, this this policy of Colin Call that Colin Call enunciated of of we're a security integrator, not a security provider, 
explicitly states that the United States will not carry out offensive countermeasures against Iran. And you can see time and time again, Iranian proxies have attacked American forces in, uh, uh, in the Middle East, and there has been no counterattack since the Qasem Soleimani counterattack. And even under Trump, we never counterattacked into Iranian soil. Um, so this has got to change. It's, and it, it doesn't mean we have to go to war against Iran, but we have to carry out offensive. We or our allies backed by us have to carry out offensive countermeasures. Um, and we're not postured to do that. That's going to be the thing that I think we all have to work toward is convincing um, uh, the American people and then the administration that the United States needs to have forces in the necessary forces in the Middle East that can carry out offensive countermeasures. Uh, they just they don't exist there now. Uh, the uh, uh, CENTCOM has been hollowed out, and that's the uh, that should be the thing. I think we should all uh, uh, we sh uh, that should be one of the things, the main thing that we should all be uh, focused on. Uh, 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 having said all that, I'm really uh, uh, pretty optimistic. I'm even optimistic about Turkey, but I don't want to turn this into a uh, uh, I don't want to turn this into a brawl over uh, over Turkey, but if you want to discuss that later, we could do that too. We'll, we'll come thank to you. that in, in questions, uh, Dr. Durant. Thank you. Uh, your uh, your Goldilocks here. <laughs> You're a little <laughs> little more optimistic than uh, Carolyn, or maybe a lot more, um, a little less um, optimistic than um, our colleague Shoshana Bryan. Maybe you're just right. Uh, we'll see if you're just right in terms of uh, your your predictions here. I think you certainly are with respect to your last point that uh, we've got to be postured for uh, offensive operations of our own or in conjunction with our allies uh, to deal with the Iranian threat. Lastly, um, and very importantly, we're going to come back to where we began with our colleague David Wormser to make some uh, uh, concluding remarks, um, uh, sort of the cleanup batter, if you will. Uh, David, I don't know where you come down on this spectrum of optimism versus pessimism, but uh, lay it out. Uh, sure. Well, you know, one of the problems going last is everything you wanted to say has been said. So, but that's never deterred me from speaking anyway. So, uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead here. Uh, the the first thing is, uh, I think in terms of the American Israeli relationship, there are positive trends and negative trends. The the negative is what's been described here. Uh, the positive are the increasing understanding among many Americans. That the fate of Israel and the and the uh, policy on Israel is a microcosm of one's view of oneself in the Amer in America. So I think ultimately how the American Israel relationship goes is somewhat of a reflection of where America goes. It is no longer an external issue. For the progressives, it is the touchstone of taking down American foreign policy. Uh, and for the uh, for conservatives, I think, and for more classic old school liberals, uh, it, it still is a foundation of what they see as America. So, you know, if you look at Steny Hoyer or so forth, that's what I mean by old school liberal. Uh, so so the real question here is who prevails in America about America and that that in the long run, I think, will determine most how the how the relationship with Israel goes. And frankly, if the choice is against Israel, then I think it bodes very ill for our own republic, because the foundations of being pro-Israeli in U.S. foreign policy are the same foundations that, that drive American patriotism and uniqueness and exceptionalism and so forth. It is, we, we are intertwined culturally. Uh, I, I think when Netanyahu came to Washington in one of his earlier trips, uh, and there were a lot of fights between Barack Obama and, and Netanyahu about settlements and so forth. Uh, the, Netanyahu got on TV and he, he started going through, through the monuments in Washington and where, this, where the various speeches, uh, what the, he went through the speeches that were enshrined in those monuments. Uh, Lincoln's Monument and so forth, and began to note how much of it is tied to the foundation of the Judeo-Christian culture. So at the end of the day, I think that the direction of Israel's American relationship is the direction of America's view of itself. Now, uh, going to the uh, uh, 
a part, obviously that does have an, a, a pessimistic direction and a positive direction. Uh, and, and I can't quite say now which, which will prevail, but my gut tells me, reading American politics, that the progressives have overreached and in time they will flare out. Uh, <laughs> it's not a sustainable point of view. Uh, I think that what Michael said about the region will, will uh, contribute to that. I think their foreign policy is a catastrophic collapse of America's position. I'm not sure that's not what they want. But at any rate, it's not what most Americans want. We don't like humiliation. We don't like being taken hostage. We don't like being shot at uh, and, and, and so forth. So I don't think they have America behind them, really. And now, going on to the next thing is uh, what Shoshana was saying, the tightening relationships. Actually, over the last 40, 50 years, um, <clears throat> since the Nixon administration, which was what Carolyn referred to, it's been a little bit worrying because the increasing Americanization of Israeli defense sort of led to a situation where the Israelis were trading in strategic initiative and strategic independence for a strategic umbrella from the United States. And there are, there, it's not a clean black or white issue, uh, but there are probably some cases in which I think that undermined some of the the uh, some Israeli strategic interests and, and in some cases obviously helped but but it also undermined it. I think this is about to change and what what Shoshana is saying I think therefore becomes incredibly important. It's going to change I think on two levels. The first is the United States is now pass more passive. This is what Michael uh, was referring to when he talked about this uh, regional integrative structure. America is becoming more passive, which means that the United States defense structures, if before it was the Israelis becoming Americanized, meant that Israel had to sort of sit on its hands at critical moments to trade in for the gorilla in the room, the American power. Um, now what you're beginning to see is somewhat of an inversion where in many ways, America's interests in the region will be furthered mostly by a more active Israeli uh, assertion of power, if even sometimes Washington doesn't realize that. But I think CENTCOM realizes it. I think the Saudis realize it. I think the UAE realizes it. So it's not just CENTCOM. <clears throat> I think it's the other members of CENTCOM are coming to the terms that they don't want an Israel that is passive, that is uh, waiting for the Americans to act and is happy just to live under an umbrella that may or may not be fully real at times. So I think the deepening Israeli-American strategic relationship now becomes much more of a peer alliance, much more like what Britain and the United States had at the end of the 30s uh, than, it, than it's been over the last 50 years, which as much as I love Israel, it's been more of a dependency. Yes, Israel's done tremendous things in the region to help the United <laughs> States. But on balance, the United States, Israel saw the United States as the, the senior partner that was their strategic umbrella that they have to defer to. So it wasn't an equal relationship in that sense. I think it's becoming much more equal. And as it becomes equal, then Israel has, the, I think, the room to move, to act, the way it hasn't been in the last 40 years. Now, the question is, in Israel, what's happening? I said, on one side, the uh, American uh, view of itself will determine the relationship. In Israel, I believe what you're beginning to see, and whether Ben Gvir or Smotrich are the answer, I'm not really all that sure about that, but um, there is beginning to be in Israel an understanding that they have to pick the ball up again. And that the strategic imagery of the last 40, 50 years has reached sort of a climax. Uh, I think even under the current administration in Israel over the last few months, you have begun to see some of that uh, take effect. It wouldn't go very far. It's sort of like when, when Jimmy Carter understood the Soviets were a threat. He started the process of rebuilding American power, but it was hesitant. It was apologetic. And the real leadership that was required for such an assertion was absent. And I think with the outgoing administration in Israel, that you have a similar situation. But I do see 
now. And I think the one of the most fateful elections in Israel was the one that just happened, even though it was seen to be just another of five, a series of five inconclusive elections. Uh, the truth is, I think that right now, an Israeli government that is more attentive to asserting its power when it needs to is exactly what can reset the American-Israeli relationship on the strategic level in a way that I think both the region and ultimately the United States wants. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm rather optimistic about that. Uh, At any rate, I, I won't go much further, but I, I still think the bottom line is, does America understand itself? And will it manage to overcome this wave of, uh, quite frankly, radical progressive assault no. on the United States? And if it does, I think you start seeing with the conservatives, you start seeing with some others that there are actually positive <laughs> in the American-Israeli relationship. And I think that question about America's future ultimately relies on its youth. And unfortunately, so far, I see the youth being lost in America. Uh, uh, but that that's a battle that I think many Americans are beginning to understand. So in that context, I can't say I'm optimistic or pessimistic, but I think that's ultimately the determinant. Well, uh, uh, David Worms are a very fascinating um, sort of wrap <laughs> to the program to this point. And I think in particular, your pessimism about America's youth is uh, is something that will obviously have great bearing on how we see ourselves, how we see our values, how we act on them going forward. So that's a point of departure for a, a quick round of questions. Um, I'm, I'm just very, very impressed by both the quality of the points that have been made and, uh, and some important differences that have emerged that I hadn't frankly anticipated. So we'll talk a little bit about them. Um, the, Carolyn, maybe to you, uh, this issue of, um, well, the glass is more than half full, according to some estimates, um, despite uh, the trajectory that you've described, um, partly because <laughs> of the assessment that um, it's so wrongheaded, it's so um, out of sync with reality, it's so unsustainable uh, that there will be a course correction inevitably, um, partly because of uh, the new government in Israel. But how, how do you respond to that assessment of where the trajectory may go? Well, you know, I, I agree that, you know, it can go either way. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth about the way that I think it can go either way. And that is um, the question of, of, of anti-Semitism, because uh, any way I slice it, and I've been looking at this issue for, for, for a long time, um, when you look at the um, obsessive compulsive uh, interest in, the, in pushing Israel to make territorial concessions to the Palestinians, and you look at the way that it's um, descended into an abyss of, of of animosity uh, towards Israel uh, to the point where you know the EU just put out a or, or a leaked uh, EU report showed that the European Union not only is pushing the Palestinians and uh, and really by design to take over government lands in areas of Judea and Samaria that surround Israeli communities <laughs> and that are of vital importance from a Jewish heritage <laughs> perspective and from a strategic perspective. But also that they oppose archaeological excavations in Judea and Samaria because those prove Israel's uh, ties, the Jewish people's historic ties to the land of Israel, and they don't want that to come out. So they're actually in a race against um, archaeology, um, and uh, the Palestinians are undertaking systemic uh, and systematic destruction of, uh, of archaeological sites in Judea and Samaria to try to blot out the history of the Jewish people here. We're celebrating Hanukkah. Almost the entire Maccabean revolt took place in Judea. Uh, and so uh, it's all of these areas here that are under assault, and it's funded by the, by the European Union. But I think that, you know, one of the aspects of anti-Semitism that's, um, that's important to understand when you're looking at a possible trajectory 
for better or for worse, is that it's irrational. It's not a hatred that's based on anything that Jews do. It's based on an erratic, uh, on a, on an irrational uh, demonology of Jews and of the Jewish state, and um, and the policies that that come out of an anti-Semitic worldview are are also irrational. And we've seen that. Um, with the with the obsession of Americans and of Europeans with the with the uh, Palestinian claim that Israel is 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 effectively an illegitimate state, um, and so I think I think that you you see that uh, getting stronger among progressives. You see it domestically in rising anti-Semitism against Jews, particularly on college campuses, but increasingly throughout the United States. So on the other hand, you have rational policies and you have policies that are often uh, characterized with philo-Semitism on the part of Americans who recognize that American uh, culture, American heritage is based on the Bible and based very much on the story of the <laughs> Jewish people, the exodus from Egypt and the four the found the our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I think that, you know, um, it's really a, a question of a wrestling match between the traditional or American heritage and woke uh, revisionism of America and what it means to be an American and what America represents in the world. Um, but I think that to the extent that rationality wins, and we all have to work <laughs> towards that end, <laughs> That um, that the that the basic components of the Israeli on a rational level that the uh, that the Americans are well disposed to massively expand their partnership and alliance with Israel for the betterment of both countries and if that happens really the sky is the limit and, you know I always feel like uh, you know our outgoing government. I felt like we were being run by a bunch of rat boys who really just wanted to be accepted by the in crowd, which they viewed as the Democrats in the United States. And they bent over backwards uh, and and I think undermined some, some of Israel's critical strategic interest in order to please the Biden administration. Um, and I think that that was a big mistake. And I feel like now we have the grownups coming back in charge and they're less concerned about what people think of them and more concerned about advancing Israel's national interests. And again, as, as I think all of us are agreed, America's uh, basic national interests from a rational perspective and Israel's national interests are very much aligned with one another, if not completely in sync then enough in sync to make it uh, stand to reason that the United States would want to avoid any open spats with Israel. Um, so I think that if the cultural battle can win, uh, if, if traditional American uh -huh. values and uh -huh. patriotism win out in this battle, <laughs> then really uh, uh, it would be an extraordinary thing uh, for the United States and for Israel. And I don't think that it's impossible. I think that it's very possible. And, and like everybody here has said rightly, the progressive overreach is so enormous um, that it, it may very well just be a matter of time, in which case, just as Netanyahu uh, <clears throat> dunked and parried for eight years to wait out Obama, uh, that may be the case as well for the next two years under Biden. And then we'll see a happier state of affairs for the United States and for its alliances, first and foremost with Israel uh, in the years uh, that will come afterwards. Well, a touch of But optimism. I do have to go, so I, 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 you, I, on Charles. that after Mr. Mac, I'm going to have to leave you. So thank you very much ha for having ha me. On happy this. birthday, my dear. Thank you very much. <laughs> great, great <laughs> last uh, comment. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me, if I can, uh, just uh, come back to you, Michael Duran, uh, on that Turkey issue, because I, I do think in a way, it, it's a kind of metaphor for what we're talking about here. Um, the seeming um, absolute hostility of uh, some towards the state of Israel on the one hand, uh, namely the Turkish government specifically in this case, um, perhaps having to uh, bend, if you will, 
in the face of uh, certain realities in the region. Is that is that why you are uh, more optimistic on that score than Mort? No, I I, I read uh, Turkey differently than uh, uh, than Mort does, and I, I read the Turkish connection to Hamas uh, uh, differently. Let let me first uh, talk about uh, a few words about my optimism on this uh, score. Uh, we've seen uh, normalization of relations between Turkey and Israel, and we've seen uh, a clear alignment um, between Turkey and Israel in the South Caucasus, where they are both uh, supporting. They're both supporting um, Azerbaijan uh, in part uh, against um, uh, uh, against Iran. Um, we just had uh, the the Turkish Defense Minister Hulusi Akar. Uh, uh, went to Baku, um, and um, and and then uh, the Israeli defense minister went to Baku, and then the Israeli defense minister went to Ankara, and was well received in um, in Ankara, and that was all read in Baku as uh, um, uh, as a alignment against uh, Iran and Azerbaijan. Uh, so there is this triangle: Turkey, Israel, um, Azerbaijan. That has um, come into place, and I think it's. Uh, uh, I think it, I don't want to overstate it, but I think it's significant, and it's uh, uh, all the parties are are, are aware of it. Um, the the hostility that we saw between uh, Ankara and Jerusalem is uh, considerably declined, and the, I think we have to understand the Turks as um, heirs to the kind of 19th century uh, European. Uh, power politics. This is how they play the game. They're not the only ones who play it this way. If you look at the uh, Turkish relationship with Russia, for example, uh, there are areas like, for example, Turkey is one of the biggest supporters of Ukraine. Uh, so it's a great supporter of Ukraine and a supporter of Ukraine in all of its claims, territorial claims against uh, Russia, um, and is supporting the war against Russia. But it's not anti-Russian. It's got lots of back and forth with Russia. So um, the 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 Turks, uh, as I read them, are aligned with Hamas to a certain extent. Uh, uh, I don't think they're supporting uh, they're supporting operations against Israel, but they have this relationship with Hamas, and that's because of two things. On the that's a signal to the Israelis regarding two things: one, the growing strategic relationship between Israel and Greece. Israel is regularly uh, conducting military exercises together with the Greeks. Uh, but also, the Israelis seem to have a clandestine relationship uh, with the YPG, that is the Syrian arm of the PKK in uh, in Syria. Uh, it was reported in the press, for example, got big attention in Turkey that uh, that um, um, Eyal Hulata, the former national security advisor of Israel, uh, went in, uh, I think it was uh, last July, uh, uh, to the Americans and ask them to put pressure on the Turks not to intervene in Syria against the, the YPG. My assumption is that the, uh, there have been other reports about Israeli clandestine relations with the YPG in Syria. My assumption is that they have some people there on the ground. I'm making this up. I don't have any information, but uh, it makes, if you want to say, why would the Israelis have such a relationship? Uh, it's because they're concerned about the Iranian uh, land bridge that goes from Abu Kamal across Syria. Uh, but they have aligned with the, the, the PKK is, is, is the number one enemy of uh, uh, of the Turks. Uh, and so it's a tit for tat. Uh, thing that the Turks are doing. They're saying, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to have this strategic relationship with Greece and Cyprus, you're going to have a, you're going to have a connection to the PKK. We're going to have a connection to uh, Hamas. Uh, I, I would expect that if the, if those issues changed on the Israeli side, we'd see a change on the, uh, uh, on the, on the Turkish side. I don't, I don't, in other words, to put it in one sentence, I don't, I don't read it as an ideological hostility to the state of Israel. Um, and I think all of the other uh, areas where the two uh, where the two work together suggests that there isn't a really deep seated ideological hostility. To it. <laughs> well, Mort, I'm going to come back to you uh, to comment on that if you care to. Uh, but also, if you would also develop a little bit um, the concern you expressed about some within Israel um, who are seemingly 
promoting a revolt against the new government, um, the not yet installed <laughs> government, I guess is more accurate. Um, could you touch on both of those very briefly? We'll sorry, uh, sorry, to, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I, I don't want to look rude that I'm leaving while Marta is going to respond to me, but I have to leave as well. Um, so uh, thank you. We're, we're over. We're we'll, over the we'll, time we asked you to a lot. We'll uh, let you know what comes of it. Thank you very much. I, apo I apologize for leaving. I'll, 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 I'll see you later. And we can I'd love to follow up on this. <laughs> We, we will definitely drill down on it further. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, for, uh, first of all, I might say the last time I was in Turkey was in 1998, uh, about 25 years ago. And of course, at that time, uh, uh, there was the identical hostility, praising Hamas, supporting Hamas, condemning Israel for all the problems, condemning the occupation, stealing the land, killing innocent Arabs. I heard all of that from all the top leaders from Erdogan on down in 1998, and I was uh, uh, shocked to hear the same thing today. Uh, obviously, I am, uh, as all of us, I think, are uh, uh, very happy about the, that there's now a, an improved relationship between the two countries. But the uh, ideology of hostility toward Israel and the praise of its enemies uh, remains as it was 25 years ago. I, I've seen no difference. Uh, with, res with respect to that, <laughs> uh, I might say uh, we have to keep in mind uh, that uh, with this administration, uh, despite the optimism, despite the, the, about military operations seeming to be a, a, a positive development, <laughs> every single appointment that, a, a, that Biden has made that affects Israel is someone very hostile to Israel, every single one. And they almost all of them are friends of Obama, whose, of course, hostility to Israel is known uh, and continues. <laughs> uh, so with respect to Iran and, and the whole relationship, when we see that Robert Malley was appointed as the chief negotiator for uh, <laughs> America with Iran, uh, a man who opposes any sanctions on Iran, a man who says we have to accept Iran getting nuclear weapons, who says that, a man who wants to embrace Hamas, it shows you that we cannot depend on America doing the right thing by, with respect to Iran and that they're ready to stand by and allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. Mm. When you have the administration appointing Hadi Amar to the, a, an elevated post in relation to the Palestinian Arabs, a man who praised the Intifada, the terror war, saying it inspired him. A man who accused Israel of war crimes and supports boycotting Israel. This is the top negotiator for America uh, to the Palestinian Arabs. Uh, and we hear no condemnation from the Jewish world, even, uh, of this appointment. Mahir Bittar, who's the head of Intelligence National Security Council. Mahir Bittar is on the board of Students for Justice in Palestine, a vicious anti-Israel group. <laughs> and Bittar had seminars at Georgetown uh, leading them of how to demonize Israel, a man who also, of course, supports BDS. Uh, when you have Avril Haines, uh, the head of the National Security Council, accusing Israel of terrorism and violence, Israel of terrorism, we see where this administration is with respect to Israel. It's in a very, very bad place. And, and, uh, and, and Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, in 2012, leaders of Israel told me in private meetings they were going to hit Iran in 2012, and they never did it. And they told me later that Obama sent an envoy virtually every week threatening Israel, don't you dare hit Iran. And Netanyahu is not the strongest prime minister. Remember, Netanyahu, under pressure by Obama, publicly supported the establishment of a Palestinian state, something he was always against, and he did it under pressure. He collapsed under pressure. Obama, uh, Netanyahu had a 10 month freeze where he wouldn't allow any building uh, 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 anywhere in Judea and Samaria or Eastern Jerusalem. Mm. For 12 years while he was prime minister, he didn't build a single new community in Judea and Samaria. And he did not allow uh, a government building at all in Judea and Samaria and in uh, Eastern Jerusalem. The mayors there complained to me about it. He is not a strong leader. My hope is that the government he's forming, that, that the other elements of that government will strengthen Netanyahu and, and do the right thing for Israel and ultimately, which is the right thing for America as well. 
Mort, I, I have to interrupt you. We're, we're just hard out of time. I just want to just toss a question to Shoshana. Thank you uh, very much for that that uh, that closing comment. Uh, Shoshana, uh, Mike Duran talked about the hollowing out of uh, CENTCOM, the U.S. Central Command, and under present circumstances, it seemed uh, his belief that even with Israel's strong support, it's not up to the job of effectively mounting uh, either in its own right or in support of Israel, the kind of operations that may be needed to counter Iran. Um, could you give us uh, two minutes at most on that? Two minutes at most. Um, Mike also said something that was very, very important. President Carter changed the trajectory of defense thinking uh, when he was after the invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah, but it took Reagan to fill the holes that were left behind. What happens in the United States is the change in thinking comes first. Carl Vinson before uh, World War II started the rebuilding of the Navy, but and so the Navy was ready after Pearl Harbor to go out there in the Pacific. Um, I think what you need is a change in trajectory thinking. But the way you're gonna to get to an actual change in military capability is if the military people know what they want and know where they wanna to go to get it. So what I see is the militaries are planning for what they need. This administration is unlikely to give it to them, but to the extent that the administration has a change in thinking, like the Carter administration, perhaps if we're lucky and it won't happen before the change of administration comes here, uh, we will be better positioned to fill in the holes and do the things we need to do. I'm with Mike. If you have to do it now, it's going to be a big problem. If you have to do it three or four years from now, two or three years from now, even 12 months from now, you need the guys to think together first. And that's what's happening. Hmm. That's heartening indeed. Thank you. Um, David Wormser, I'm going to give you just a minute if I can. Um, one of the wild cards in all of this at the moment is what China is trying to do. We've seen it most recently in Saudi Arabia. How does that factor in, very briefly, if you could, to where we and the Israelis need to go? Well, I think I, I think China is one of the main uh, strategic threats to the United States, and I think what we'll find is that the Israelis, and this this goes to what Shoshana's saying, is I think CENTCOM's beginning to think about it. I think structures underneath are thinking about it. Probably won't happen in this administration, but I think the Israelis are shifting on China, and and CENTCOM is focusing on China. So I think you'll see the Israelis beginning to become a major element of U.S. defense against China and the region and their ability to work with Saudi Arabia and so forth is very important. The second thing I think about China is the battle of, with China to some extent now is Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some tensions between Iran and China, uh, very, very surprising and very recent. Uh, and I think it may be China is hedging its bets. It's not confident. Iran will survive. So it's reaching out to others. But this really shows the vulnerability of China in the region, that if the Israelis, the Saudis, and a post-Ayatollah Iran uh, come into existence, uh, this forms a strategic foundation that anchors American power without a lot of American effort. And I think that's the inversion I was mentioning before, that, yeah. that Israel becomes critically important to upholding America's position in the region, rather than America helping the Israelis in the region as much. Yeah. And that's, that's why I think the deepening relationship that Shoshana describes is so important in a trajectory way, which is what Shoshana described. Yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, really very helpful. And uh, I think particularly the point that uh, getting... Iran out from under the mullahs is one of the pieces of this uh, Rubik's Cube that we want to get, get right, face up right quick. Thank you to each of you, uh, especially those of you who have already departed. I want to say um, a word of thanks uh, as well to those of you who are still with us. A fascinating hour and a half and very, very informative on a whole host of issues. Uh, we're going to take up some of these topics again in the near future, and we will welcome all of you in our audience back for those further comments. I hope you'll stay tuned, as well as that you will disseminate the video of this product, which will be available at securefreedom.org shortly. In the meantime, 
Thank you very much for your attention today. Thanks again to uh, all of the extraordinary people who have helped bring this about, and we will talk with you again soon. Until then, this is Frank Gaffney. Thanks so much for watching.